Hello, Adult Sunday School Leader. In our walk with God, we will inevitably sin. It's just a fact of life, and we all fall short of God's standard of perfection, don't we? In fact, Paul wrote in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And that even holds true after we're saved. But what sets us apart as Christians is how we, how we respond to our sin. Do we try to hide it, cover it up, pretend it didn't happen? Or do we confess our sins, seek forgiveness, and receive the blessings that come with it? A Psalm of David gives us a beautiful picture of the blessings of confession and forgiveness. And that's what we'll be exploring today as we continue in the unit called Dealing with Temptation. This is lesson number five called Recovering from a Fall into Temptation. The focal passage is Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7. And the point of this lesson is return to God for forgiveness and restoration. Well, like most things in life, we can either err in one or two extremes when it comes to how we view God and sin and forgiveness. We think that our sin is too egregious, that God could never forgive it. That's one extreme. The last part of Romans chapter 5, verse 20, tells us that when it, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. That means that God's grace, his unmerited favor, is always greater than any sin we can commit. Now, you've heard the saying that you can't outgive God. Well, you can't out sin God's grace either. Well, on the other hand, we can think that if we sin, eh, it's no big deal. We can just ask God for forgiveness, and that's what he's got to do. That's why Paul balanced his statement in Romans 5.20 with his next sentence in Romans 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, when he said, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. I love what the King James Version says. It says, God forbid. No way. That's, that's abusing God's grace. Besides, sin always has consequences. Our passage this week is the first seven verses of Psalm 32. It's a psalm of David, and it's one of those seven penitent psalms. That is a psalm of confession. Well, let's get a little background as to why this psalm was written. The 27 verses of, sec of 2 Samuel chapter 11 takes place over nine months. You're most likely familiar with the story. It's one of King David and Bathsheba. It's a story of lust and adultery and murder. So here's a quick synopsis. David sees his neighbor, Bathsheba, bathing on the rooftop next door, and he wants her. He sends for her and sleeps with her, and as a result, she becomes pregnant. Now Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, he's off at war. So David sends for him to come home, thinking he'll sleep with his wife and he'll think the baby's his. Well, Uriah returns to Jerusalem, but refuses to go to his house and enjoy the comforts of his home because his men are out in battle. They're out sleeping in the, uh, out in the open country. Why should he enjoy the privileges of home? Well, after a couple of days, David sends Uriah back to battle and sends word to leave Uriah exposed at the next battle, which kills him. David then takes Bathsheba as his wife. Whew, crisis averted, I'm sure he was thinking to himself. However, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan, the prophet, went to David and told him the story of a rich man who had lots of sheep. He took a poor man's only pet lamb, and he had it prepared for a meal, leaving that poor man with nothing. And David was infuriated, and he said that rich man must pay the poor man four times over for his selfish deed. Then Nathan said to David, one of my favorite Hebrew phrases, Atah haish, you are the man. The story was a parable. David was the rich man who took another man's wife as his own and had the husband killed. After this confrontation, David confessed in the first part of 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, King David wasn't a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination. He committed some of the sins that some might find unforgivable. Yet the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. Perhaps he was thinking about his uh, encounters with Bathsheba and Nathan when he wrote Psalm 32, which is what we're going to look at now. Those two verses from our lesson text this week, uh, Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2, are similar in structure to the Beatitudes that we see at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 through 12. The first Beatitude that we see 
uh, in the entire book of Psalms is in the very first verse of the very first chapter, Psalm 1-1. And it says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way of, uh, that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. It's a blessing on the obedient. Now, the first two verses in our text, however, are a blessing on the disobedient. It's a statement of blessing on those who have transgressed or they have sinned. Not because they've sinned, but because of the forgiveness they receive from the Lord after their sinning. And, and that blessed could also mean happy. It indicates a mental and emotional state of satisfaction. And that blessedness that's mentioned here in these first two verses, it's going to be contrasted a few verses down with David's state of misery after he sinned. We also see in these two verses an example of Hebrew literary parallelism. That is, making a statement and then restating it in a different way for emphasis. We see this throughout, um, especially Psalms and Proverbs. Verse 2 is a restatement of verse 1. And even though they're very similar statements, they describe sin and forgiveness in different aspects. David used three words for sin. But in the NIV, only two English words are used, transgressions and sin. The transgressions are rebellions. They are deliberate acts. Sin, is the first occurrence there of sin, is missing the mark of God's standard of, per of perfection. That could be intentional or unintentional. The second sin is translated iniquity in some other translations, which means a deliberate choice to do wrong. Now, the terms for forgiveness are also similar, but carry slightly different meanings as well. Verse 1, forgiven, means taking uh, taking away of a burden. Also in verse 1, the, the term sin is covered. It's a word picture that shows that sin is covered or no longer meets the eye of the judge. So no punishment is decreed. And in verse 2, the sin is, uh, the term here is no longer counted against them, as in the debt has been canceled. Now that last phrase in verse 2, in whose spirit is no deceit, it might be a little difficult to understand, but it simply means uh, the one being forgiven is not trying to deceive oneself or to trying to deceive God uh, that the request for forgiveness, it's sincere. He or she is not abusing God's grace, as we've mentioned earlier. Now, our next two verses are verses 3 and 4. And when David uh, kept silent, when he did not confess his sin, he said that he was a physical wreck. He used the phrases, uh, my bones wasted away, and my strength was sapped as the heat, or, or as in the heat of summer. And even though David's symptoms were physical ailments, David's root problem was not physical, but it was spiritual. He had sinned. He had broken fellowship with God. These ailments that David was experiencing were God's chastening. They were his discipline. They weren't punishment. They were, they were discipline. It's because the goal of punishment is, is retribution. That's not the case here. The goal of discipline is reconciliation. God wanted David and us, when we sin, to willingly come to a place of surrender. Now, in between verses 4 and 5, you see a strange word, selah. Uh, and it's seen throughout the book of Psalms, and the exact meaning of this word is really as unclear. It could be an indicator to pause and to reflect on what's just been stated, or it could be some kind of musical direction. In verse 5, David stated that he acknowledged his sin to the Lord. You know that in any 12-step program, the first step is acknowledgement of the problem. I have a problem. That's true with confession as well. Admit that you have sinned. You also see in this verse that David used the three words sin, transgression, and iniquity. He also said that he quit trying to cover up his iniquity. You see, when you... When I try to cover up our sin, it's like putting perfume over a horrendous body odor. You just can't cover it up. In fact, it probably makes it worse. But when God forgives, he washes the stink and sin of guilt away. And that was the result that David enjoyed upon his confession, the forgiveness of the guilt of his sin. On December 27th, 2019, my wife didn't feel too well that day. She started having some stomach pains, and she knew something wasn't right. And around 11 o'clock that night, when she said that she thought we ought to go to the emergency room, I knew something wasn't right, because she is not that person who runs to the doctor. Pain is an indication that something isn't right in the body. Guilt is to the conscience 
like pain is to the body. It's an indicator that something is wrong. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we feel guilt, it's time to go to the spiritual doctor. He's the only one who can forgive and take away that guilt. Now, verses 6 and 7 are the last part of our scripture this week. David wants to, to save others from undergoing the same mental and physical consequences that he endured. And whenever those who are faithful, he said, that is, God's people, whenever they sin, they should pray immediately. Don't wait. Try to cover it up for yourself. The guilt's only going to fester and manifest itself physically. Let me tell you this story. When I was in seminary, I um, had this problem on my upper gum. And there's a little blister that would come, and I hate to say this kind of gross, but I'd pop it. It'd drain. And it kept coming back and kept coming back. Got a little bit bigger. So eventually, I did go to a dentist, and he referred me to an endodontist. And ended up, he x-rayed and all this stuff. He says, well, you're going to need an apicoectomy. What is that? Well, he told me what it was, and it didn't please me a bit. He said, what we do is we slice the gum, kind of flat back the gum, go in there, clip the roots, uh, take out the abscess, pack it with medicine, and sew it back up. Um, I wasn't too pleased at hearing that, but I did it. I had to do it. Don't have an issue with that tooth now. My ignoring it, that problem, or treating it myself, did not help the problem go away. I had to go to an expert who could treat my ailment. Now, similarly, only God can forgive and cover up your sin guilt. David continues here by poetically describing how God will save the sinner from the continuing or the continued effects of, of guilt, saying that the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. Now, as we as we read verse 7, let's not take this as a promise from God that no trouble is ever going to come to a believer. Let's read it with the understanding that when we are in the right fellowship with God, when we're doing what we're supposed to do and not doing what we're not supposed to do, that fellowship is like a secure hiding place from sin. Now, not that we won't sin, but the more mature, the more stable our fellowship is with God, the less likely we are to sin. Now, the title of this lesson is Recovering from a Fall into Temptation. So, what do we do? What We do what David did. First of all, we acknowledge that we've sinned. Then we quit trying to cover up the sin and we quit trying to make excuses for it. And then we confess our sin to God. Confession, confession, you know this, doesn't educate God. But it allows us to agree with God that what we did was against him. That's why David, or that's what David did in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 13, which I mentioned earlier, when he stated, I have sinned against the Lord. And what's the result of all this? Forgiveness. That's where God covers up your sin with the blood of Jesus so that it's seen no more. The restoration of fellowship with the Heavenly Father occurs then. But, not necessarily the removal of earthly consequences will occur. That's because, um, because of David's sin, the baby he fathered, it died. And his household was wrecked with calamity. So don't ever think that your sin has no effect on anyone else. It can affect generations. Psalm 32, it's, it's a beautiful reminder of the blessings of confession and forgiveness. When we confess our sins to God, we are freed from the burden of guilt and we receive the joy and the safety that comes from being in a right relationship with Him. So as we go through life, let us be quick to confess our sins and seek forgiveness, knowing that God is always able always ready to extend his grace and mercy to us. So next week, we're going to finish this unit by looking at uh, the strength to stand against temptation out of Ephesians chapter 6, the spiritual armor of God passage. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget, pray for and with your class.